work in genetics and one of the things we do in genetics, one way you would have done genetics back in the day before people knew what genetics was and looked at DNA and things like that, is we looked at family trees, right? And you can see certain things run in families. Uh, you can see certain diseases run in families, certain traits run in families. But when you think of family trees, another thing that you might think about is royal families, because they would be, of course, very proud of their relationships. And um, part of this pride in their relationships and in the distinction of their pedigree means that they would often marry each other. So when you look at a royal family tree, like say somebody like Charles II of Spain had this famous um, elongated chin called the Habsburg lip. Um, and he was also um, not a terribly healthy man. But when you look at his family tree, his mother was also his cousin, right? So there was quite an inbred individual. And this isn't good news usually in terms of genetics. But um, genetics changed a lot when we started learning about DNA. And especially with the structure of DNA that Watson and Crick were the ones who discovered and they quite famously, euphorically and slightly arrogantly claim they discovered the secret of life. Right? But we'll see if they're justified in this. So I brought along this model of DNA, as you can see, terribly accurate, but um, it's very simplified with this um, children's toy. But basically what I've got here is two strands which are the two strands of DNA, like two lines. So does anybody remember the name that you call the shape of DNA? I think nearly loads of people know it. Double helix. Yeah, who? <laughs> double helix, right? So this would be twisted, right? So these are the, it's double because it's two strands. But the important thing about DNA is what they call the base pairs, right? So there's letters A, C, T, G, but I, instead of having four letters, I've got four colors. And the important thing about these is the pairing is really strict. So A always pairs with T, C always pairs with G. So what I've got is green is always with blue and red is always with yellow, right? These are my base pairs of DNA and this is my structure of DNA. And the really important thing about DNA, like why is DNA so important? Why does it have a claim to being the secret of life? Well, it's because DNA is capable of making copies of itself. And in the simplest sense, what is being alive is making copies of yourself, whether it's by making babies or by making more bacterial cells or more yeast cells. So this is DNA. So we've got one rule, which I want, I'm gonna need a volunteer, and I want two volunteers who can play with children's toys. <laughs> Who are, I'm not going to be terribly, uh, not going to be terribly taxing. But all you need to remember, all you need to remember is that green goes with blue and red goes with yellow. So who thinks that's too taxing for them? Don't step forward now. <laughs> Come on, I need volunteers. Okay, so volunteer number one. Yes. So what happens when DNA replicates? is it splits apart, so it unzips. So this is the DNA unzipping. So I just want to remember yellow and red and green and blue, right? That's all you've got to remember. So I've taken it apart, and you will notice these are, not, these are different from each other, okay? These are not the same as each other. And I want you to fix it now, build it back, just remembering red and yellow, green and blue, okay? These are the pieces. So use more pieces and build it back up. Okay, so this is what happens when um, anything grows in order to transmit the information from generation to generation, uh, DNA needs to be copied, right? So DNA carries lots of information. You are human because you've got human DNA. You look very like members of your family because you've got lots of the same DNA as members of your family, right? So, one, so this thing that happens, DNA has this information that gets transmitted and it has to get transmitted by a copying mechanism. And the beautiful thing about it is the copying mechanism is really, really simple. And these guys are going to go really hurry up preschool <laughs> preschool toys <laughs> which we're going to see we have a, ra a race to the finish here but uh, <laughs> putting you under pressure my children love this toy they find it nice and easy yeah, yeah so okay <laughs> but um so 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 dna copying of dna is what carries information from generation to generation. But if you think about DNA and genes, most of you probably think you don't understand very genetics very well. You're right, I don't understand genetics very well, and I'm a geneticist. Genetics is really, really complicated. And so we got this problem that we've got extremely complicated information that needs to be transmitted from generation to generation. But the thing that makes it great and the thing that makes DNA, you've got to get it back together in the right way, I hope, potentially that, may, that gives P D DNA this justification as the secret of life is that uh, so the thing that gives it potentially a good claim uh, to being the secret of life is that the yes. mechanism of transmitting information from generation to generation is really simple. So the, the, the gener passing genetic information from generation to generation, from cell to cell, is really, really simple, no matter how complicated 
what the genes and what the DNA does is. So all you need to know, as these people are hopefully about to demonstrate, is the pairing rule, okay? So all you need to know is that, come on, <laughs> it's good enough. It will just go, we're nearly there. So all you need to, oops, I just broke again. All you need, see if I get it right. All you need to know is that red goes with yellow and green goes with blue and you should have perfect copies. I hope we got more or less, except for the bits that are missing, right? So all you need to know is red goes with yellow, green goes with blue, and you got copies. Okay, so we did this once, allowing for how slowly it went. Okay, well, we won't do it again, but if we were to do it again, would it work again? If I pull this apart, pull this apart, will it work again? Yes or no? Yes. How long will it work for? How many times will it work? Forever. DNA replication works forever and has been working forever, right? So this has been going on since the origins of life. So. If you pick a cell in your body, right, pick any cell in your body, think about it, so pick a skin cell or something. The DNA in that cell was created by this mechanism, right, by an old DNA strand that split in half and a new strand formed along each, each of the old sides, right? So pick a DNA and you can trace back the history of that cell and you go back and back and back and back and back and eventually you end up at the fertilized egg, the first cell of you, the first photograph in everybody's family album. That fertilized egg has DNA from your mum and dad, so that DNA in your fertilized egg, the first cell of you, touched the DNA in your mom and dad's bodies, right? So the DNA, there's a physical, not a metaphorical, but a physical connection between DNA of all the generations. So then, and you pick a, like in every cell, in every cell of the bodies of your mom and your dad, the DNA there was copied from a previous cell from a previous cell. Then you go back to your grandparents and your great grandparents, right? So you can think about this physical chain going right back through the generations. And then what you can do is you can also think about, well, how many people am I related to? So it's very easy, right? You've got two parents, you've got four grandparents, you've got eight great grandparents. So it's just two to the power of the number of generations back, right? So it's two to the one, two to the two, two to the three. And I'm going to shout over the bit. I'm not going to, stop, I'm not going to be stopped by the traffic. But uh, <laughs> so if you count back 10 generations to around about the time of Marie Antoinette, you've got about 1,000 ancestors. If you count back 20 generations to about the time of Leonardo da Vinci, you've got a million ancestors, right? A million ancestors at the time of Leonardo da Vinci. If you count back 30 generations to the time of the Black Death, then you've got, then you've got a billion ancestors, right? So a billion ancestors. Every one of you here has a billion ancestors at the time of the Black Death. So some of you might already have skipped ahead on this because what do you think the population of the Earth was at the time of the Black Death? not a billion right so what's going on here so think back again to those royal family trees right you know certain people marrying their cousins this is what's happening all of us we've got you've got one billion ancestors but some of those people are the same person right so everybody here myself included we're all inbred and so this is what we learn from genetics but we go back further this DNA touching DNA touching DNA touching DNA works for all humans, but then it goes to other animals as well. So think about some awful animal. Think about the most peculiar thing you've ever seen on any nature program. Something with, you know, like horny bits and gloopy bits and horrible things. So your DNA has touched DNA that's touched DNA that's touched DNA that's touched their ancestors' DNA, right? So we're all related. But then it goes even further than that because this relationship, this copying of DNA through all of life and through every organism applies to everything that's living, right? So even the grass here, any of the trees and the plants, there are some genes that are so important that they never, never change in terms of evolution. And they're almost identical between humans and grass, right? So there's one gene called histone 4, it's my favorite example. It only has two differences in the, in the protein that's made, two differences between humans and grass. And uh, so this means if you think about when you're eating a sandwich, wheat, right? Wheat is a grass. So the, the wheat that goes into making the sandwich has genes that are, you know, as good as human genes. I like to say this to unsettled vegetarians from time to time. But uh, so, so that's one thing to remember. But this actually is the power of genetics, right? Because we have this commonality through all of life and through all of genetics so when you look at a gene in grass you can see its relationship to the human gene and if you want to do an experiment you can't do experiments in humans but you can do experiments in grass and you can learn something about that way that gene works if you go into a genetics department one of the things you'll find in the first most important genetics departments 
where they studied everything and learned everything we know about genes today would be tiny little fruit flies. The Drosophila fruit fly is the favourite organism of geneticists because they're tiny, they don't complain about being kept in a little glass vial with lots of food, they're very happy actually, mushed banana. Um, and uh, you can learn a lot about genetics, you do crosses from these, this is how they discovered the principles of genes, this is how they discovered the, what, that there's something special about uh, some chromosomes versus others, that, they, that genes if you think about a big long string of DNA, genes are like beads along a, a, a string, right? So this is the, this, all these things have been discovered by looking at flies. And this is the amazing power of genetics because this commonality, this DNA that's copied through all the generations and is shared by every living thing means that we can, under, make, can do experiments and learn things across all of life. But the, the thought I leave you with, with all of these relationships and that everybody's related to everybody including all the animals is think about any of your family members your parents your mum and dad they're related your boyfriend it's probably part goat and uh, but this is <laughs> so this is the thought if you remember one thing you can remember that so thank you very much for coming i hope you have a great day